let's look at page 63. We have here some tips for writing, and this tip is to tell you that when you start writing, the first things that you put on the page don't have to be perfect. When you start writing, the important thing is to get your ideas onto the page. It says here, come up with many ideas first, then organize them later. A common mistake inexperienced writers make is to edit while writing. However, editing and writing are entirely different processes and best done separately. What is the problem of editing while writing? It slows you down. Editing is a very precise, careful process. The early phases of composition should be more spontaneous and inspirational. Also, a lot of good ideas are killed if they are edited out too quickly. This should be they. In the early part of the writing process, focus on writing down as many creative ideas as possible. Without judging with whether they are good or bad, simply write down your ideas as they come. Only after you have written down lots of ideas should you begin the process of organizing them. So again, try to put down all of your ideas first and then figure out the best order and if you need to delete some of your ideas. This is especially useful in exams because you have limited time, so you need to plan that time wisely. Spend like five to ten minutes thinking about all of the ideas you might want to use, then put those ideas in a logical order in an outline. And once you have the outline, it will be much easier to write the actual essay. So here we have a writing practice. Um, this is optional. If you want to me to correct your writing, you can uh, write this email and then send it to me and then I will correct it for you. Imagine you are a university graduate working in your profession. An underclassmate from your department sends you the following email. How would you respond? Um, since you're working now, try to write in a professional but friendly manner. Your message should be about 60 to 100 words long. And this is the email that you receive. Dear alumni brother or sister, I know you're busy with your job now, but I hope you can give me some helpful advice. I must give a speech next week for my class and I'm very nervous. When you were a student, you always did everything so well. <laughs> Can you give me some helpful advice for not being so nervous when I speak in public? Thanks so much for your help, your university underclassmate, Joey. Uh, so if you want to, you can write a short response email and send it to me. Uh, one point of vocabulary, this word alumni. Uh, this is. When we say um, someone who has graduated from the school. There are a number of ways to say this. All of these words are from Latin. For one person who is a man. You would say that this person is an alumnus. If there is more than one person and they are all men, you would say that they are alumni. If there is one person and it's a woman, then she is an alumna. And if there is more than if there is more than one person and they're all women, then they're all alumni. Latin is a complicated language. 
Uh, I took Latin in college, so I have firsthand experience. Uh, English is comparatively simple. In Latin, for example, if you want to say the third person uh, pronoun, your desires and diamonds, there are 36 options. Whereas in English, we only have six. Um, yeah, so the interesting thing about this word, xiaoyo, is that the plural for men and the plural for women are pronounced the same. Both are called alumni. So when you're speaking English and you need to say alumni uh, for men and women, you can just say the same sound, even though it will actually be two different words. OK, let's go on to page 64. And. These two guys need to prepare a presentation. And they have. A number of tasks that they should do. So what order do you think they should go in? Which one should they do first? Which one should they do second? And so on. Let's see uh, what they have to do. They have to pick the best idea. Practice the presentation in front of a mirror or friends. Write an outline. Prepare pictures or some kind of visual aid. Time the presentation. Is it too long or short? Brainstorm for ideas. Research the best idea. So what order do you think they should follow? Um, I'll give you five minutes to think about it and then we will compare answers.
OK, let's compare answers. I think the first thing you should do is. Brainstorm for ideas. You have to know what you're going to talk about in order to talk about it. Once you have a lot of ideas, you should. Number two, pick the best idea. And now that you know what you're going to be talking about, you need to find out what you're going to say. So number three, you should research the best idea. Now you have a lot of information. How should you put this together? One way, number four, is to write an outline. With an outline, you can then write out your presentation. And once you have written down your presentation, you need to find out how much time will it take. So number five, you should time your presentation. Is it too long? Is it too short? Uh, once you know how long it will take, you can adjust your material to control for time. Uh, and then when you have the words ready, you should also, number six, add some pictures or visual aid. Presentation is not just listening to you talk. Someone is all the audience is also looking at you. So you should give the audience something to look at. So with the words ready and with the visual aids ready, you can now begin practicing your presentation in front of a mirror or in front of friends, number seven. And uh, if you practice in front of friends, they will give you some suggestions and advice, and you can take that advice and continue modifying your presentation until you think you are ready. Questions? OK, let's move on to page 66. Grammar. So this is a whole page of uh, examples and questions, but this entire page is telling you one thing. Cause and effect must appear in the same sentence. What this means is that if you write a sentence that begins with because, then you the second half of that sentence must also say the result. If your sentence only has the cause, but it does not tell you the result, it is not a complete sentence. So you all know that for the final exam, there will also be a writing question. So after we finish um, lesson five and lesson six, I'm going to spend a little time talking about grammar, and then we will practice writing in class, and you will also have a writing assignment that everybody has to do. Um, that will be in a few weeks. For now, let's uh, focus on the units. OK, this next part is kind of weird. Um, we have this guy, Dr. Boris Yon, who says that he is an expert in giving terrible presentations, boring presentations. And the textbook wants us to, I guess, think about or correct all of his advice. Because if he's an expert at giving boring presentations, we should do the opposite of what he wants us to do. So first he says, do not announce your topic at the beginning of your presentation. You definitely should announce your topic at the beginning of your presentation. Next, he tells us to read our paper. Um, and I think that this is a really bad idea. We've talked about how when you're preparing to give a speech, you probably have to 
choose your words and write it down. But when you actually give the speech, you should try to interact with your audience. Supposedly they are there because they want to hear what you have to say. So you can use that interest. You can create a loop, a feedback loop of energy. The more they pay attention, the more you give your audience. The more you give your audience, the more they will pay attention. So the worst thing you can do is you stand on stage and you just read from a piece of paper and then you sit down. Um, that's not a presentation, that's a reading. But actually, the second worst thing you can do, I think, is to memorize your speech and to say exactly what you have memorized. Because it's actually the same thing as reading, except instead of reading from a piece of paper, you are reading from memory. In both cases, you are not engaging with your audience. Uh, you are not building on that um, energy feedback loop. So what is the opposite of reading your paper? I think the best way to give a speech is remember the key points that you want to say. And if you need to learn some new vocabulary or words, memorize those words. But when you actually give the speech, try to um, put together your sentences um, from the beginning each time. So you don't have to remember every single word. You only have to remember the key points that you want to tell your audience. Um, and that will give your speech a sense of energy, a sense of something is happening right now. And your audience can feel that. Number three, uh, speak in a monotone. Monotone is kind of like this where I'm speaking and it's there's no energy. It's the same sound for all the words. So don't do that, right? When you give a speech, try to put some energy into your words. Be lively. Um, change your tone. Go high, go low. Try to catch your audience's attention using your language. Number four, use no humor. You should try to be funny. You don't have to like prepare jokes, but you can use like a, a more humorous attitude toward the topic that you are presenting. It could be something important that you're sharing with your audience, but you don't have to treat it so seriously. There is always room to be light and humorous, even when you're not making a joke. Uh, next, it says lose your audience. <laughs> no, you want to keep your audience's attention. Um, try not try to use language that your audience will know. Try to design your speech so that uh, it's not too hard to understand. If you're trying to teach your audience something, um, try to make sure that your audience understands the first thing before you move on to the second thing, and that they understand the second thing before you move on to the third thing. If you go too fast, your audience will not be able to keep up, and at a certain point, they will give up, and they will stop paying attention. So try to keep your audience with you as you give your speech. Next one, speak quietly. No, speak loudly. Um, in fact, when I'm teaching, I usually don't need a microphone. The only reason I'm using a microphone is for the English subtitles. So when you give a speech, don't be quiet. Make sure your audience, the person furthest away from you, can hear what you're saying and can hear you clearly. Don't make your audience like struggle to hear you. The next point is very interesting. 
Dr. Boris Yan says to give a boring presentation, you should tell the audience all that you know. Give your audience all of the information. This is bad advice. If you really think about it, um, if I gave you everything I knew about every single word and every single sentence, you would be bored out of your mind. The point of a speech or presentation is not just to give information. In fact, most of the time the point is not to give information. If the audience wants information, it's probably all on the Internet somewhere. They can find it for themselves. The point of a presentation is to entertain, is to make the audience interested and to let them enjoy the experience. And hopefully, if they enjoy the experience, they might also learn something. But if they don't enjoy your speech, they will definitely not learn anything. So instead of telling your audience everything, when you plan your speech, again, make sure your audience can follow each point before you move on to the next point. And also try to focus on the more interesting points. The big points that the audience will find the most useful or the most entertaining or the most interesting. And then if someone does want to know more, they can ask you a question after your presentation. The next piece of bad advice is to never review what you have said so far. Uh, now we talked about this last week. When you're giving a speech, the audience only has one chance to hear what you're saying. If for that moment the audience falls asleep or their phone rings or something happens and they miss what you say, they don't have a second chance. So when you give a speech, you have to give your audience that second chance. Repeat yourself. Repeat yourself. Repeat yourself to make sure that the audience did catch what you want to say. Usually you will repeat yourself at key moments during your presentation. For example, after the introduction, uh, you can say in this speech we will talk about A, B and C. Then after you finish A, you can say we just finished talking about A. Now let's talk about B. After you finish B, we've talked about A and B. Now let's talk about C. And then before your conclusion or at the beginning of your conclusion, you can say today I've told you about A, B, C, D and E. Give your audience many chances to, uh, to catch your information. Number nine, this piece of bad advice is do not use visual aids. Um, some speeches, you don't have to prepare something to show your audience, but for most of the time, your audience will want to look at something. Um, in this class, we have the textbook and the screen for you to look at. If you don't have this kind of thing, maybe you will write or draw on the board. Maybe you will bring physical things to show your audience. At the very least, you should use some body language. We talked about this before the uh, midterm exam. Body language helps your audience understand what you're trying to say. So those are some things you can pay attention to when you give a presentation. I think I just did uh, the exercise on page 69 and 70. All right, explain why these are wrong. OK, cool. Uh, now let's move on to page 71. We'll do some listening practice. 
Um, let's look at the questions first. One, what is Steve's first problem? So this tells us two pieces of information. One, there's a guy named Steve. And two, he has more than one problem. So what is his first problem? A, his roommates invest too much. They, so investing is of course taking money and putting it somewhere to make more money. Why would this be a problem? How strange. B, entertainment is not an interesting topic for his English presentation. OK, maybe. C, he cannot think of a good topic for his presentation. Possibly. D, Valerie doesn't want to help him do his presentation. OK, so we can uh, pay attention for Steve's first problem. Number two, how does Valerie help Steve? A, she tells him the answer. B, she asks him questions that make him think of the answer. C, she forms a committee, 委员会, writes an agenda, 一层, does research, and writes a report to explain what he should do. She either likes him or they're very good friends if she does this. D, she gives him her old presentation. Number three, what is Steve's first topic? A, the economy. B, the environment. C, the entertainment industry. D, exploring the internet. Once again, we are reminded that this textbook was written many, many years ago. Number four, what does Valerie say is wrong with his first topic? A, it is too boring and has no pictures. B, it is too confusing. Nobody knows what it is. C, she, say, she says there is no problem with it. D, it is too broad and has no specific examples. Number five, Place an X next to the two specific examples that Steve makes. So in other words, which of these examples does Steve actually use? Taiwan's water is dirty. Taiwan should invest in solar power. Um, Taiwan should invest in nuclear power. Taiwan needs better clean air laws. Taiwan has too many dogs. Number six, Steve says his roommates talk too much and play music too loudly. What kind of pollution is this? It's some the Uran. A, noise pollution, which is the correct answer. This is noise pollution. B, air pollution. C, water pollution. D, nuclear waste pollution. We don't even have to listen to the question. The answer is A. Seven, Valerie doesn't like the idea about Steve's roommates. Why? A, she says it is too important to talk about. That doesn't make sense to me. If it's very important, doesn't that mean you should talk about it? B, she likes Steve's roommates and does not want to embarrass them. C, the example is only about Steve's life, so no one else will care. <laughs> D, Valerie doesn't think Steve's room is part of the environment. And number eight, Steve had two good ideas for a presentation about the environment. What is a third environmental problem in Taiwan that needs to be solved? So I'll let you think about that uh, later. Now that we know the questions, let's listen to the passage.
Okay, that was kind of fun. Uh, so let's go through these questions and see if we uh, heard the answers. Number one, what is Steve's first problem? Uh, C, he cannot think of a good topic for his presentation. He has the idea of the environment, but he doesn't know what to say. Also notice that in English, the word cannot is one word for some strange reason. All of the other ones, right, did not, have not, are two words. Only cannot is one word. Number two, how does Valerie help Steve? B, she asks him questions and make him think of the answer. That's mostly what Valerie is doing in that dialogue. She keeps asking him questions and helping him to think. Number three, what is Steve's first topic? B, the environment. Number four, what does Valerie say is wrong with his first topic? D, it is too broad and has no specific examples. So he says, the environment, she says, OK, great. What are you going to talk about? He says, we need to protect it. She says, OK, how? He says, I don't know yet. So he needs more specific examples. Number five, which two specific examples does he use? The first one is solar power. The second one is clean air. Uh, he talked about how Taiwan could use more solar power uh, so that every building could generate electricity. And then he talked about how the air, especially in Taipei, is terrible because there are so many dirty cars and scooters. Number six, Steve says his roommates talk too much and play music too loudly. What kind of pollution is this? It is noise pollution. A. Number seven, Valerie doesn't like the idea about Steve's roommates. Why? C, the example is only about Steve's life, so no one else will care. Now, the fourth option, D, is a trap. Because they do talk about this. Both of them agree that Steve's room is part of the environment. And this is true. This is a very important idea. The environment or nature is not something over there. It's not something outside of the city. It's not something that you have to travel far away to see. 
we are all part of nature. We are all part of the environment. Um, so this is the kind of thinking that leads to uh, industrial pollution, when companies think that, oh, this is not nature, so we can dump our trash here. That's not true. Nature is everywhere. OK, and then number eight, uh, what is another topic uh, about the environment you can talk about? If you can't think of anything, you can pick from this list. The textbook very conveniently gives us some options. OK, that's the end of unit five. Do you have questions? Do you want me to make you give a speech? No, OK. Um, so in that case, let's jump to unit six. Um, for the final exam, it is units five and six, but also two, three and four. And a writing question. EQ and U, great. So this unit will be about EQ, emotional intelligence. Uh, the Q stands for quotient, sangshu, uh, which is a word from, from math, right? Um, when you do division, because uh, IQ and EQ both started as a kind of concept in statistics, so it's related to math. Um, so let's look at the warm up questions uh, to see what the unit wants you to think about. Do you know any successful people? Who are they? Why do you think they are successful? What does success mean to you? OK, so the textbook wants us to think about success. Different ways of thinking about success. Uh, and here are some common reasons people think uh, success comes about. So like when you ask, when you think about a successful person, uh, many people will think that they are successful because of some of these reasons. Ambition, ye xing, the desire to get something done. Creativity, chuang yi, intelligence, uh, how smart you are. Patience, how long you can wait. Optimism, how good you think things are. Luck, rin qi, good looks, how uh, beautiful, handsome, or sexy you are. Getting along well with people. Honesty and a good sense of humor. OK, let's read the article. When it comes to predicting people's success in life, it may be that a person's IQ is not as important as a person's EQ. IQ, short for intelligence quotient, is your level of intelligence based on tests measuring your brain power. EQ, short for emotional quotient, is a measure of a person's emotional intelligence. Until recently, the only measure of intelligence we had was IQ. However, we have many examples of people of high intelligence who haven't achieved their goals in life. On the other hand, we also have examples of people who don't have a particularly high IQ, but they have gone far in life. How does this happen? The answer to this question could be that many successful people have high emotional intelligence, or EQ. This refers to qualities like understanding your own feelings, controlling your emotions so that your life is made better, 
and empathy for the feelings of others. In other words, people with a high EQ know how to get along with people and are usually well liked. Emotions are essential for good decision making and for preserving harmony around us. We admire people with nerves of steel who have the ability to harness their emotions when they face pressures. We also enjoy being around people who can express empathy, compassion, cooperation, and forgiveness. We need these emotions to be happy in our home, school, and professional life. People with high emotional intelligence are able to motivate themselves and persist at something in the face of frustrations. They keep up the hope of achieving their goals despite difficulties and setbacks. Emotionally intelligent people are able to control their mood swings and keep distress from overwhelming their ability to think. They're also able to control impulses and delay gratification. Perhaps you suddenly feel like going out and meeting some friends, but you decide to do it later after you finish your homework. You've just shown one characteristic of emotional intelligence. EQ is not the opposite of IQ. Some people have a lot of both and others have little of either. Scientists are trying to study how EQ and IQ work together to complement each other. A person's ability to handle stress, part of a person's EQ, affects the body's ability to concentrate and put intelligence to use. Among the ingredients for success, some scientists say that IQ accounts for about 20%. The other 80% consists of luck, social class, and EQ. So now you have a general idea of what this passage is saying. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, we will look at the structure of these five paragraphs and then we will look in closer detail at the language.
Okay. So this reading has five paragraphs. The fastest way to find out the main idea of each paragraph is to read the first sentence. So let's do that. When it comes to predicting people's success in life, it may be that a person's IQ is not as important as a person's EQ. So from this sentence, we have three main ideas. Success, IQ, and EQ. Now, most of us know what IQ is. EQ is a bit newer. Maybe some people don't know. So from this first sentence, it looks like this essay will introduce EQ by comparing it to IQ and then tell us why EQ is also important for success. So the first step is to compare EQ with IQ. So this is what the first paragraph is doing. Second paragraph, first sentence. How does this happen? OK, so we have to go back and read the last sentence of the previous paragraph to understand what this is. On the other hand, we also have examples of people who don't have a particularly high IQ, but they have gone far in life. So how does this happen? How do people who do not have a high IQ become successful? Well, we know that this essay is going to be about EQ. So the answer is probably that these people have high EQ. So this paragraph is going to introduce what EQ actually is. Right, this refers to, so it's explaining the idea of EQ. Next one. Emotions are essential for good decision making and for preserving harmony around us. OK, so this paragraph will talk about how EQ can help us make good decisions and preserve harmony. Number four, people with high emotional intelligence are able to motivate themselves and persist at something in the face of frustrations. So it looks like this paragraph will talk about how people with high EQ can work through obstacles and frustrations, can keep the motivation. And then in the fifth paragraph, EQ is not the opposite of IQ. OK, so the essay began by telling us the difference between EQ and IQ, and it ends by telling us how EQ and IQ work together. So the structure of this essay is quite clear. Each paragraph has its own main idea, and for most of the paragraphs, you can catch that main idea by reading the first sentence. The only exception is the second paragraph. How does this happen? Does not really tell us the main idea of this paragraph. OK, so let's look at this reading in more detail. Let's look at the language. When it comes to predicting people's success in life. So when it comes to something, this must, after the two, this must be a noun. So if you have an action, you need to turn it into a noun. And you do this by making it a gerund. Gerunds can also take an object. So here the object is people's success in life. So in fact, in this sentence, this is one thing. So when it comes to now the main sentence begins here. It may be that blah, blah, blah. This is the main sentence. 
usually in order to tell the reader where the main sentence begins, you should add a comma before it begins. So there should be a comma after life. 这边应该要加逗点, 告诉读者说主要句子从哪边开始, Now it says it may be 或许是如此, that a person's IQ is not as important as a person's EQ. The essay cannot say that this is a fact. It is only possible. If the essay says that this is a fact, then it needs to give us evidence for this fact. It needs to prove it. But we don't see that evidence. So it can only say it may be like this. So as it says here, IQ and later EQ is based on tests. So in other words, what it's really measuring is not <coughs> how smart a person is. What it's really measuring is how well can you take this test? Brain power, now li, is one word. A measure of. Uh, in other words, this um, A measures B is the same thing as saying A is a measure of B. Because A can go to check B. Until recently, this is something that many students uh, use in the wrong way. Until recently means that there have been changes recently. This is different from Chinese. In Chinese, we say 直到最近都还在怎么怎么, which means that there have been no changes. But in English, if you use until recently, it means that there have been changes. So uh, in writing, some of you will write something like, uh, in Chinese, you think it's 直到现在仍然怎么怎么, but in English, if you say until now, that means that something has changed now. If you want to say then you need to say even now, even today, is the way to say that in English. So when it says until recently, it is talking about the past, the old idea. So the old idea is the only measure of intelligence we had was IQ, right? Had, in the past. This is the old situation. People of high intelligence. If you want to say that someone has a kind of quality, you can use the word of. You can use of, you can use with. Daiyo, with. Both of them are fine. A particularly high IQ, or I should say, don't have a particularly high IQ. We say this in Chinese also, right? We say, gong. Which really means it's kind of low, right? It's a very polite way of saying uh, a bad thing. So not particularly high means kind of low. Uh, you also hear this when someone is saying like, um, uh, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I do have some ideas. Right, so the point is not that they are like second smartest. The point is that they are average, maybe not that smart.
to go far in life means to have great success. This comes from the, the times before uh, fast travel around the world. Back before airplanes, when in order to travel around the world, you had to take ships and boats, and it took you many years. So if you are able to go far, literally far away in the world, you probably have a lot of money. You probably know a lot of people. And so this became a way to describe success. You ended up far from where you began. Uh, in English, this means that you are successful. Uh, we have the opposite idea in the phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In Chinese, this means, something like that, right? In English, we say uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, so in paragraph two, it begins with a question. Even though this sentence does not give us the main idea, it is still not a bad sentence. It does two things at the same time. First, by asking a question, it grabs our attention. We naturally want to find out the answer to this question. The second thing it does is that it connects these two paragraphs. When it says, how does this happen? We have to think back to what we just read. So it connects the ideas between the two paragraphs. And when it does give an answer, again, there is no proof. So the author can only write could be. We don't know for sure. It is one of many possible answers. EQ, this refers to. So sometimes in an essay, you will have to explain a new word or a new idea. One way is to use this, right? This refers to something, something, something. You can also use the word means. This means something, something. Uh, another way is you can give the explanation and at the end you say that is EQ. Because when the reader comes across a new idea, an unusual idea, the reader will be expecting the essay to explain that idea. If the essay uses a new idea and does not explain it, it's not a good essay. Or it was written for a different kind of reader. So if the reader is expecting an explanation, then even if you don't say, this is an explanation. If it looks like an explanation, the reader will still get that information. And then you can add at the end of your explanation, and that is what I mean by EQ, to confirm the reader's ideas. So that, that those are three ways that you can explain something in an essay. So here, it explains EQ by referring to its qualities. So it doesn't give us a dictionary de definition. If you look at a dictionary and you look up EQ, it will have like a specific idea that fits 
uh, this word. But here, instead of giving us that definition, it gives us examples of EQ. This is another classic way to help your reader understand. Give examples. So like. Or another way to say this is such as. So these are examples. Understanding your own feelings, controlling your emotions, and empathy for the feelings of others. In English, we have two words, empathy and sympathy. Usually we translate these in Chinese as empathy is tong li xing and sympathy is tong qing xing. The meaning of these two words have changed a lot in the history of English, but today uh, empathy is trying to understand what the other person feels. Sympathy is feeling um, feeling that person's feelings, but not necessarily becoming that person. Um, so you may have heard the phrase to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. That is empathy because you're wearing that person's shoes. You are doing, you are putting yourself in that person's situation. But sympathy is more like trying to understand the feeling, not necessarily the situation. So that's why in Chinese we call this tong qing. It's directly uh, trying to to share the feeling instead of trying to recreate the feeling in yourself. And then later we will see this word, compassion. In Chinese, we also call this tong qing. Very, it's very confusing. But I guess a better way to say this is like uh, uh, compassion is simply feeling um, feeling bad for someone or feeling like um, sad for someone or feeling joy for someone depending on what the other person is going through. So compassion is your own feelings related to someone else. OK, so some examples of empathy, understand your own feelings, control your own feelings, have empathy for others. Uh, these three. And the conclusion for this paragraph says. People with high IQ know how to get along with people. Uh, in Chinese, we call this 跟人相处, to get along. Um, in English, this phrase to get along means that it's not perfect. It's not like everybody is happy. To get along means to get by. It's uh, the idea is related to the idea of tolerance. Uh, so uh, you don't have to enjoy spending time with everybody. You don't have to make everyone your friends. You only have to be able to work with them and to talk to them to get along. Xiangchu. OK, and there should be a hyphen here. Well liked is one word. Which means that um, other people like this person quite a lot. Essential four, or sometimes you will see essential two.
there should also be a hyphen here. Decision making is one word. The the act of making decisions is decision making. Uh, oh, today sometimes. Um, so usually we would say to make a decision, but today you will sometimes see people uh, write to take a decision. This comes from the business world. And the idea is that uh, a business leader sometimes doesn't just decide. The leader has to actively jump in to make a decision. They have to take that decision. So it's not you're sitting there and the situation comes to you and you decide. You have to go grab the situation and to, to actively take a decision. But the meaning is the same, right? It's just the, the imagery. Preserve harmony. Another way to say this is to maintain harmony. Maintain. And of course, here in Taiwan, when we hear the word harmony, usually uh, the first thing we think of is the harmonious society that is being promoted um, by people across the Taiwan Strait. But we all know it only looks harmonious. It's not really a harmonious society. Nerves of steel. OK, so this is related to the idea of being nervous. Jingzang. Right um, in older psychology, they used to think that your nerves, Sanjing, were directly related to your feelings about anxiety and nervousness and courage and bravery, these kinds of ideas. Today we know it's not that directly related, but from that period we got the idea of nerve and nerves related to behavior and attitudes. So if you have nerves of steel, that means you're not afraid of anything. You're like a robot. Uh, so the textbook actually describes this kind of person who have the ability to harness their emotions when they face pressures. To harness means to take control of. Um, the word harness as a noun is the, the rope that you put on a horse. Jiangsen. So you use a harness to control a horse, to make it work for you. As a verb, that's what the word harness means, to control something and make it work for you. So to harness your emotions means you don't let your emotions run wild. You take control of your emotions and you use your emotions for uh, some kind of purpose. And here it says this is when they face pressures. Um, usually we would not count the word pressure. We would just say pressure. Bukashu. So someone with nerves of steel is someone who can control their emotions and use their emotions even in situations of high pressure. Right, nothing scares them. To be around people, which means like to hang out with people. Uh, to to spend time with people. But this phrase is more vague, right? When you say you spend time with people or you hang out with people, that usually means that you are doing something together. But being around people simply means that you share the same space. 
maybe you are co-workers who are working on different projects in the same room. Maybe these are people you meet every day in your life, but you only like say hello and then you keep going. Um, but the idea is that even these people that you're not working directly with, that you're only sharing the same space with, their energy will also be passed on to you. You can still feel their energy. So sometimes you will say you will see someone say you should surround yourself with some kind of people. It's the same idea. Even if you're not working together, even if you're simply in the same space, you will be affected by their energy. If you surround yourself with happy people, you will probably be happier. If you surround yourself with angry people, you will probably be angry. Right? Um, so this is what this means. We enjoy being around people who can express empathy, compassion, cooperation, and forgiveness. Even if we're not working with them, simply being near them and around them uh, makes us happier. Um, notice how it says express, 表达, express emotions. OK, uh, to be happy. I would say at home, at school and in our professional life. The grammar is not exactly uh, the best grammar here. So the opposite of professional life is personal life. And then you also have social life. I think these are the three main ones. Do we have an online life? Or is that now part of our social life? Speaking of uh, online socials, did you know that Twitter is dying? Just this morning there was news that Elon Musk has only like 300 employees left and the building has been locked and people have been sent home. So social life might be slightly uh, online social life might be slightly less social. OK, to motivate yourself. Which mean, this means to give yourself motivation. To make yourself want to do something. To persist means to continue. It's a stronger form of continue. Right, because usually if you use the word persist, that means you are facing some kind of obstacle or frustration. So even when people are working against you, or even when there are many obstacles, if you keep going, then you are persisting. But we should also talk about this. Are able to. This just means can. All right, 能够可以, same thing. If you use the past tense, 过去式, were able to, uh, it, can is transformed into could. Right? The past tense of can is could. Then you have the future, will be able to. What is the future of can? Trick question, there is no future of can. If you have to use the future of can, you have to say 
will be able to. So that's something you should you should uh, pay attention to. In the face of, usually the thing after this will be a bad thing. Right, so even when something bad is happening in the face of. Um, here it says to persist at something, but we can also say persist in something. To keep up the hope. Uh, I guess this means to maintain hope. Um, this phrase to keep up uh, something is more common in the phrase to keep up your energy. Like even when you're tired, try to keep up your energy. Or you can eat uh, food with protein in order to keep up your energy. I wait to need a Um OK, uh, so frustrations. Uh, things that make you feel annoyed, things that um, are stopping you from achieving your goal. Uh, I guess in Chinese we would call this ban jiao shi. Difficulties, things that make your work harder. Setbacks, um, things that set you back. Right, sometimes you're working on a project and uh, part of your project goes wrong and you have to go back a few steps and try again. That is a setback. Mood swings. Your mood is how you feel. If your mood changes a lot, that is called a mood swing. Swing is, uh, I think the most common use of the word swing is chou chen. Right? It goes back and forth. It swings. So a mood swing is when your mood changes either a lot or often or both. Distress. Distress is not Stress. Distress is trouble. Um, the need for help. You guys know the uh, SOS signal, right? If you need to help, if you're like you're on the sea in a boat and you need help, you would send out a signal SOS. That is called a distress signal. It's a call for help. Overwhelming or the verb to overwhelm means that something is so big, so powerful that it stops you from doing something. So here it is distress overwhelms your ability to think. You're in so much trouble that it makes it hard for you to think. Um, so the imagery of this word overwhelm is to, it's like a wave. It's too powerful. The situation is too powerful. The emotions are too powerful. And you, you don't know how to deal with it. The opposite of overwhelming is underwhelming, which means you were expecting so much more, but the real situation is um, much smaller than you expected. Like um, uh, maybe you are invited to a party 
and the person who invites you is very popular. So you expect so many people at this party, but then when you go, it's like 10 people. That is underwhelming. Impulse, 冲动. Uh, more commonly, we see the adjective impulsive, 冲动的. So to control your impulses means to not be impulsive. Right? You think of something, you want to do something, but you are able to stop yourself from always doing whatever you think of right, right now. Gratification means to make yourself happy or satisfied. Usually happy, like you want something, you need something, and then you get it. That is gratification. So delay gratification means that you are willing to wait uh, for the thing that you want. The classic example is the marshmallow test. Yes, more Right? Have you heard about this? Um, a psychologist tested a group of kids. Each kid would have a plate, and on the plate would be a marshmallow, Miao And the psychologist would say, Okay, I'm coming back in five minutes. If the marshmallow is still here, uh, I will give you two marshmallows. And then the guy leaves and the kid has to stare at this marshmallow for five minutes. They know that if they don't eat the marshmallow, they will get a second marshmallow. But some kids still could not resist uh, and they ate it and they did not get the second marshmallow. This test is a test of whether the kid can delay gratification. Um, so that was a classic experiment, but later research has showed that actually uh, whether or not you can control your impulses actually has to do with your DNA. It's uh, inherited. So each one is Is it possible to train yourself? Yes, but it's not easy. It's not like learning something. It's, it's changing a part of your personality, and that's never easy. Um, so that experiment said that kids who can control their impulses and can delay gratification will have more success in the future. So if you can learn to do this, you will be more successful. Later research shows that it's actually the other way around. More successful people tend to be the people who can control their impulses and delay their gratification. But if you learn how to do these things, that does not mean you will be more successful. There are many other reasons for success. Characteristic. Tzu. In English has many words for the idea of tzu. Characteristic, this is one. T-R-A-I-T. A quality. We just saw this word quality earlier. Sometimes you will see the word uh, feature, but usually this is a special quality. Uh, and then you have attribute. This is usually used for people. OK, the word characteristic also has another use. If you say that A is characteristic of B, that means that A is a quality that is connected with B. When you think of B, you will think of A. Uh, so in Chinese, we call this like 代表特质, or like 独特特质. 
A is characteristic of B. A is the quality, B is the thing. Okay, let's pause here. I'll give you a long break to get to the other classroom. Do you have questions so far? Okay, I'll see you in 20 minutes. OK, let's look at the last paragraph. The opposite of means they're completely different. Every aspect, every part is different. So simply saying that EQ is not the opposite of IQ does not mean that they are similar. It simply means that maybe there are some parts that are similar. But the general idea of these two things may still be far apart. Okay. Some people have a lot of both, and others have little of either. This is a pretty good sentence. Little. Little here means not a lot. In fact, maybe nothing. Um, and and um, you'll notice that if it's positive, you use both. But if it is negative, you use either. This is because English, um, when you negate something in English, you have to negate individually, one by one. So for example, uh, if you say not A and B, that does not mean you have neither A nor B. It means you do not have both A and B at the same time. Not A and B could mean you have A, could mean you have B. It only means you do not have both A and B. So here it says some people have a lot of both and others have little, which means they don't have either one, right? Either is singular, right? So uh, negation is individual. And notice it says a lot of both, but little. There's no a uh here, right? If you say a little, that means you have some. But if you say little with no a, uh, that means you don't have any. Complement. A complement is something that completes something else. Mibu uh, was it dape? E M E N T. If it is an I, I M E N T, a complement is something nice that you say to someone else. Sanme. Right, so these two words are different. They are spelled one letter different, but when you say them, the pronunciation is exactly the same. Both are complement. But if it's I, M E N T, it is praise. But if it is E, M E N T, it is something that completes something else. So EQ and IQ work together to complement each other, which means. EQ has, uh, you have to have both IQ and EQ to be a complete person.
to handle stress. Another way to say this is to cope with stress. Um, both of these do not mean um, that there is no stress. Stress is still there. It just means whether you can continue even though you feel stress. And uh, the textbook says that handling stress is part of EQ also. A person's ability to handle stress affects the body's ability to concentrate and put intelligence to use. So the idea is that if you do not know how to handle stress, then even if you are the smartest person in the world, you will have trouble using your intelligence because you feel so much stress. And so this is one way that EQ and IQ work together. The ingredients for something or the ingredients of something. These are the things that you need in order to uh, have that thing. Uh, ingredients, 食材. So originally it meant the things you had to have to make something to eat. IQ counts for about 20%. So counts for is another word you could use um, from the small to the large. Yo A B. A counts for B or one part of B. This next sentence is the reverse. From large to small. Consists of. Um, so in terms that we talked about last week, IQ makes up 20%. 80% is made up of. Luck. Social class. So class here is how high you are in society and EQ. Um, and then here to put something to use means to use that something. Sometimes you will see put it to good use, which means to use something well. OK, so that is the details of language. Do you have questions? OK, let's listen to uh, whoever the school got to read it to us. And if you're listening at home on Teams, I'm sorry, but Teams will not convey the sound of this. Uh, file, so you're going to have to download and listen on your own.
OK. Let's move on. Uh, let's look at the vocabulary which this unit put before the reading. I think we have seen most of these words. Concentrate means to focus. Um, it can also mean to reduce. So, for example, Lian Ru is called concentrated milk. Guo uh, Zi Jinghua is called juice concentrate. Okay, predict means to guess the future. I think we've seen all of the other ones. Okay, so let's look at the exercise. This is on page 76. Um, I will give you 10 questions, right? I'll give you 10 minutes and then we will compare answers.
OK, let's compare answers. What are the C ingredients for success? Most people agree that successful people all have some common A characteristics. One important thing is having a high B EQ. These people don't have mood swings because they can e control their emotions and they can handle a distress well. Their ability to deal with B, frustrations, and B, setbacks, prevents them from being overwhelmed by life's difficulties. Nerves of steel can help a person at these times. They usually live in B, harmony with others. They also show C, compassion, and A, empathy for other people. Uh, I want to point out two things in this reading. Can help a person, you can say at these times, you can say in these times. And then here we have a phrase in harmony with. In harmony with. OK, do you have questions about this practice? OK, let's go to page 78. Here we have another reading passage and it will ask you about comprehension questions. So let's look at the questions first. Number one, what areas of emotional intelligence are listed in the reading? OK, areas of emotional intelligence. Number two, which areas involve dealing with others? Number three, what do all humans need? Number four, when would it not be a good idea to tell someone about a decision you have made? So when would it not be good? Number five, what do you need to succeed in business? OK, let's look at the reading. Emotional intelligence requires that we expand our abilities in five main areas. One, self-awareness, being aware of our emotions as they happen. Two, managing emotions, finding ways to handle fears, anger and sadness. Three, motivating oneself. Controlling your emotions to help you achieve a goal. Four, handling relationships. Managing emotions in others. Five, empathy. Recognizing emotions in others and being sensitive to their feelings and concerns. All humans need to feel respected, even the least powerful. To show respect to someone, we must respect their feelings. This means that most times, before we make a decision that will affect other people, we should ask them how they feel about the decision. 
For example, two students are going to give a presentation in the class. They have already decided how they will do this, but later on, one of the students thinks he or she has a better way to handle the presentation. He or she should discuss these changes in their original plan or the partner may feel upset. This respect for other people's feelings is also important in business. Customers want to be respected and feel important. They want to be remembered, helped, understood, and satisfied. To be successful in business, you must have a lot of empathy and respect for your customers. OK, so question one, what areas these five in the beginning? Self-awareness, managing emotions, motivating oneself, handling relationships and empathy. Number two, dealing with others. Uh, let's see. Handling relationships and empathy have to do with other people. Number three, what do all humans need? At the beginning of the paragraph, it says all humans need to feel respected. Number four, when would it not be a good idea to tell someone about a decision you have made? So the paragraph says. Before we make a decision that will affect other people, we should ask them how they feel about the decision. So we have to ask that person how they feel and then we make a decision. So when would be a bad time? To tell someone about a decision. After you make the decision. Is a bad time. You should let them know before you make the decision. Number five, what do you need to succeed in business? Respect for other people's feelings. To be successful in business, you must have a lot of empathy and respect for your customers. OK, let's look at this passage in detail. As they happen, as means at the same time. So to be aware of our emotions as they happen means while we are feeling these emotions, we know what these emotions are. This takes training. This takes work. Uh, a lot of time. We feel something, but we're not sure what that feeling is or why we feel that feeling. Sometimes we act in a certain way because of our emotions, but we don't know that we are feeling those emotions. So being aware of our emotions as they happen. Self-awareness. Is something we should practice. And once you know your emotions, then you can try to manage your emotions. Manage here does not always mean control. It means to uh, not let the emotions control you. So to, to give them like a boundary to make sure they don't go out of control. But it's not as tough uh, control as for example, to harness your emotions. Managing just means to keep them in order. Fear, usually this is uncountable because if you count it like here, it says fears. That means you're thinking about different individual things that you are afraid of. Uh, and so not only should you manage your own emotions, you should also help other people manage their emotions. And then here, be sensitive to something. 
means that you are aware of something. You know about something. Uh, you know that something is going on. If it changes, you also know about the change. The word sensitive simply means in Chinese, 敏感. But to be sensitive to, 对什么很敏感, does not mean the same thing in Chinese. 对什么东西很敏感, in Chinese is a negative thing, right? It's, it's a bad thing. But in English, it simply means that you are very aware of changes related to um, the thing. So to be sensitive to feelings and concerns means that when someone is expressing their feelings or when someone is worried about something, you know that they are feeling this and that they are worried. So concern as a noun just means something that you are worried about, something that you care about. To show respect to someone. Changes in the original plan. In this case, I think it's saying changes to the original plan. It makes more sense. Changes to the plan. Okay, do you have questions about this passage? Okay, let's stop here and we'll finish this unit next week. 还没签到，可以来这边签。